It was actually exactly five years ago, on the eve of my HBS reunions, I was sitting in my apartment in New York on, a, on the Wednesday, and I got an email from a guy named Ben Schreckinger. He was writing an article about the history of FOMO, and he said, yeah, I've traced FOMO back to you. And I said, yeah, what's the big deal? And he said, well, it's in the dictionary now. <laughs> and so I opened the dictionary, I guess I Googled it, and it was in the dictionary, and I thought to myself, like, where I've missed out on FOMO becoming a thing. <laughs> It was really meta. That's me, your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens, part of the HBR Presents Network. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic and is changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO. FOMO Sapiens, the show where I interview people who are changing the world and ask them how they choose from among the many opportunities and options in their busy lives. As regular listeners know, I invented the term FOMO when I was a student at Harvard Business School. Then I graduated and largely forgot about it until thanks to a random series of events, I came to realize that it had taken on a life of its own. The story is almost too crazy to be true, and that's why I want to share it with you today on the season three finale of FOMO Sapiens. And I've got the perfect way to do so. I'm taking you back with me to the home of FOMO, Harvard Business School. In the summer of 2019, on the eve of my 15-year reunion, the school invited me to come back and share the origin story of FOMO for an episode on its alumni podcast, Skydeck. We taped in front of a live audience, and we got deep into FOMO, FOBO, and a few other topics that are near and dear to me. It's a really fun and wide-ranging discussion that unpacks the foes, their drivers, and their implications, and it's a must-listen for all all you FOMO sapiens. And there are definitely some thank yous in order. I want to thank Dan Morrell, the host of Skydeck, for interviewing me and then allowing me to share the audio with you. I also want to thank Nitin Noria, the dean of Harvard Business School, who just announced he is retiring. Nitin is the reason that FOMO sapiens has joined the HBR network, and for that, I am very eternally grateful. Following that interview, make sure to stick around for the phone moment of the show where I'll be talking to a current HBS student to find out if 15 years after my classmates and I graduated, the school is still truly the home of FOMO. It's going to be a great show, so you won't want to miss out. And to make sure you never miss out on all things FOMO Sapiens, you can text FOMO to 66866 or visit patrickmcginnis.com and sign up for my newsletter, What Did I Miss? As I mentioned before, this is the finale of season three. I'll be back in a couple months with season four. So keep in touch. Send me great ideas for guests on the show and uh, take care of yourselves, FOMO sapiens. FOMO. So Patrick, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I think naturally we should start where this all started, which was back here on campus around 2002, 2003. What were you seeing as a student at HBS that led you to write about FOMO and FOBO? So, uh, first of all, I want to say there is a witness to this in the room, which is Mel Couture is up there. She was, she was there, um, in, in my ski house, which was, uh, it was the laboratory of FOMO, as it were. I come from a small town in Maine called Sanford, and not a lot of FOMO in Maine. People go to L.O. Bean. They walk in the woods. I, I refer to my father as the man who knew no FOMO. <laughs> and um, and it's a simple life. And then after college, I moved to New York, and I was too busy to, to sort of look around and see what was going on in the world. And I came to HBS, and I come from a very blue-collar place, and I was suddenly in this choice-rich environment and in a way I'd never been before. And it was overwhelming to me, and it was exciting to me, and all I wanted to do was do everything. And I did everything. I was in every club. I joined the sailing club for the hat. I never stepped out on the water. <laughs> <laughs> Wine and cuisine, private equity. I went on every trek. Uh, I went uh, to all the lectures. I took all the classes. And we all do. This is something that all of us live at HBS. And it occurred to me that this was so different from the world that I came from, that it was remarkable and it needed a name. And I've been a person who always comes up with names for things. Uh, over the years, I've named a private equity fund. I named a book. I've named, I've come up with a bunch that never went anywhere. But I thought this was, you know, this was remarkable and it, it needed a name. And I started calling it fear of missing out, which is a bit of a mouthful, shortened it to FOMO. And I introduced that into my friend group. And there was another term that was related called fear of a better option or FOBO. 
And these are uh, persistent in the lives of students at HBS. And so as I was graduating, it occurred to me that I should memorialize this one way or another. And I was actually my section Harvest rep. I'd never written anywhere before except for the Harvest. Uh, and, and so this was uh, the place that I decided to write about this experience. It was about a fictional student named Cumnock Hawes and his <laughs> struggles <laughs> overcoming FOMO and FOBO at HBS. And it came out in the harvest, and, and it was well-received, and that was, you know, I just thought that was the end of it. I left HBS, and, and you know, that, that was it for me. But then, fast forward 10 years later, this thing takes on a life of its own. You get a phone call from a reporter at Boston Magazine. Talk about that story and how these ideas came back into your life. Yeah, so one interesting thing about writing that I have learned is the minute you put content out there, for good or for bad, it lives, and you never know where it goes. And so it was actually exactly five years ago, on the eve of my HBS reunions, uh, I was sitting in my apartment in New York on, a, on the Wednesday, and I got an email from a guy named Ben Schreckinger, who has gone on to his own fame in, as a writer for Politico. He's an extraordinary uh, journalist. And he was a stringer, and he was a freelancer, and he was writing an article about the history of FOMO. And he said, yeah, I traced FOMO back to you. And I said, yeah, what's the big deal? And he said, well, it's in the dictionary now. <laughs> and so I opened the dictionary. I guess I Googled it, and it was in the dictionary. And I thought to myself, like, where I've missed out on FOMO becoming a thing. <laughs> it was really meta. And so I said, listen, I'm coming to Boston tomorrow. Meet me at the, the hotel downtown. I'll tell you the story of FOMO. And I did meet with him, and he was super inquisitive. We talked about it, and I thought, well, this is interesting, and, you know, we'll see where this goes, but really didn't think much more about it. And then about two months later, I was sitting on the tarmac uh, in Buenos Aires flying back to the States, and I get an email from a, f a friend of mine who's like, have you seen this article about FOMO? And I said, I have no idea. So I, I opened the article, and it turns out Ben has written this article from my perspective. It's like the story of Patrick's FOMO. I thought I'd be like a paragraph in this thing. It was all about me. And... I'd ne and I was the guy, if you Googled Patrick McGinnis, all you would get was the other Patrick McGinnis, who was the CEO of Ralston Purina. <laughs> and so I'd never had any media, and I kind of freaked out, and I felt very nervous. We were like, what is the downside of this? You know, where, where is this going? I read the article a couple times on the plane, um, and then the next morning I posted it to Facebook and then took a nap when I got back from Argentina. I woke up, and all of a sudden my inbox was full, my Facebook was overflowing, and I realized that this was something that had had some legs to it. And so that was, you know, how I sort of came to realize that this was going on. And then from there, you know, we'll talk about this more, but it's become this kind of part of my life that, that is unexpected. Yeah. And I do want to talk about the growth of this idea and how it's led to, you know, your podcast and your upcoming book. But this article, as I understand it, also led to a phone call that you had with Penguin, right? And it led to your first book. Talk about that story, how the, those two things are connected. Yeah. So I worked in private equity coming out of HBS. Career was going really well. I was doing international investing, doing deals in Pakistan and Turkey and Colombia. Everything was terrific. Unfortunately, I was working at AIG Capital Partners. So 2008 rolls around, and I was right in the middle of that. And it was a very, um, it was a very disorienting experience. And I sort of ended up leaving and, and, and um, starting my own firm and doing more consulting work. But having worked in private equity, I realized I had no upside. And so on the side, I started investing in things and sweat equity and, and, and small uh, investments. And some of those did well. And I decided to write about a strategy called the 10% Entrepreneur, which is using 10% of your time, money, and energy doing things outside of your day job. And I showed this, uh, my writings, you know, this was my scribbles to a friend who showed it to a friend of his from Harvard undergrad who was a literary agent over in London. And she said, you know, work, she worked with me on a proposal and we sent it out and we got 33 rejections, uh, because I was, you know, people were like, how do we market this guy? This is this random person who, yes, he's doing these things, but he has no sort of hook line. And so right around the time the article came out, I sent it to my agent and she's an extraordinarily smart woman and she sent it over to Penguin. And two weeks later, all of a sudden, I had a book deal. <laughs> so, I mean, it's ridiculous, but true. And so that was, not only did it sort of um, get me uh, sort of out there as a book, as, as an author, but it was interesting because as I traveled around the world, uh, what I realized is people like the 10% entrepreneur, but the selfies always came out when they heard that I invented FOMO. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and I was once, this is kind of a funny, everybody here may know a gentleman called Kevin Ryan, who was a major figure in tech in New York. And I was talking to him and I was so excited to be talking to him because he's such an impressive guy. And somebody cut in and they said, oh, you know, I was getting ready for them to, to want to talk to him because, you know, why wouldn't you? And he said, well, can I take a picture with you, Patrick, because you invented FOMO. <laughs> and that was this moment when I said, I'm going to write my next book about FOMO. That was the exact moment. <laughs> Let's talk about the first book, though, a little bit more and explore the ideas behind it. Uh, what inspired you to write it? And talk a little bit about uh, the, the story. So there was a couple of things that really drove my decision to write The 10% Entrepreneur. Number one was frustration. I, when AIG blew up, my stock fell 97%. And as I said, I come from the small town of Maine. I don't have some inheritance to fall back on. This was my job. This was my life. And I realized I had not diversified myself. And then I had believed in this illusion of stability. You know, when I came out of HBS, like, let's get this job at this. I didn't think AIG was that exciting, but I liked the division I was in. And it was a very stable, it was top 10, I think, largest balance sheets in the world at the time. And overnight, this disappeared. And I watched as the management team of the company hid under their desks. And there was no leadership. And it really bummed me out. And I thought to myself, I will never, ever put my entire well-being and career in the hands of other people. Somebody pushes the wrong button, makes the wrong bet, and all of a sudden, my job is gone. And it was a very big wake-up call for me. And I, then I thought, well, I've got to diversify. But I wasn't sure how to do it. And frankly, I'm pretty risk-averse. And so as I thought about this, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start investing in the ideas of my friends that I understand. I'm not going to start buying things and investing in things I don't get. I'm going to start getting involved in businesses that I understand as an investor, and I'm going to also give sweat equity. And a friend of mine, um, the first opportunity I had was a friend of mine who had gone to Stanford uh, around my time, and he, he started this company working with YouTube celebrities, and I'd never worked in a startup before. I didn't feel comfortable, but he kind of dragged me into it. And I sold our first piece of business. I'd never sold anything before because I was on the buy side. I was too good for that. Um, <laughs> and I sold a, a campaign for $25,000. And I was, I remember I was jumping up and down in the elevator at our, our, our Smirnoff, who was our client. And then it didn't go anywhere. It didn't scale. But the same friend gave me the opportunity to invest in his next startup. And it's a company that's called Ipsy. And it's gone on uh, uh, to be a company that's doing hundreds of million dollars of revenue. And I invested when it was worth nothing. And so this experience... I thought, you know, I'm spreading my bets and I'm building something for myself. And no matter what happens at my day job, it's mine and I can take it with me. And I thought, you know, this is interesting. And I started talking about it. And all of my friends who in the beginning had doubted me and were like, why are you doing this? Started asking me to have lunch so I could explain it to them. And I thought, why don't I just write this down? And so that was the impetus for the book. And as I wrote the book, I had two big goals. Uh, number one was, well, three. Number one is it had to be accessible. It could, you know, I wanted my friends who were MBAs to be able to read it and understand it, but I also wanted somebody who picked it up in another country, who maybe didn't have the opportunities that uh, my friends from HBS did. I wanted them to be able to look at it and, and get something out of it. Number two is I wanted it to have all kinds of different people who are nothing like me and looked nothing like me, had very different experiences. And number three is I wanted it to be just about 50-50 men and women that I profiled. And uh, so I, I went into this endeavor. I wrote it, and it came out in 2016. Um, so it's been an adventure ever since. So the book comes out in 2016, uh, critical success. And then what makes you return to these ideas of FOMO and FOBO? So it was that pull. It was this idea that, you know, I, so I've spoken about the 10% entrepreneur I've, uh, all over the world, everywhere from, I was just in, uh, in Guinea-Bissau talking about it in this, this like mud hut in the middle of a field with these goats outside which was, which was really interesting and, and just to see how people sort of react to it there. And I've talked about it here at HBS or at Cambridge. And what I've seen as I've talked about it is, is that people are always interested in the FOMO bit. And that is something that, that they always want to talk about. And as, as I started to think about it more and more, I realized, you know, FOMO and FOBO, which are these related concepts, really have a strong business, uh, application. You look at Bitcoin. You Google Bitcoin and FOMO, there are a million results on Google. Look at Theranos. Uh, John Carreyrou, who wrote the book about Theranos, Bad Blood, which is extraordinary, mentions FOMO right in the book. Then you think about FOBO, fear a better option, and it really, if you think about analysis paralysis, you think about people who um, uh, are unable to innovate because they're, they're stuck trying to decide which road to take. As I thought about these two concepts and how they combined, I realized there was a book about FOMO, but there was also, you know, had to be related to this book about FOBO. And I started writing about it and, um, 
and I realize that as I talk to more people and, and interview people, I realize, you know, it is very much a, a phenomenon of technology and social media and all these things that we typically think about. But it is as it is part of the human condition that goes back to Eve in the Bible and that apple. That was FOMO. <laughs> and so it was. <laughs> The original FOBO. It was. It was. And, and it's funny. There's a, there's an incredible gentleman, uh, Monsignor uh, Fred Dolan, Frederick Dolan, who's an HBS grad, who is the, um, the vicar of Opus Dei in Canada. And he found me through the wonderful HBS website. And he sends me, he does sermons about FOMO and FOBO. It's extraordinary. And so I realized, like, this is something, this, this is a lot of meat in this. It can be a business book, but it also can be so much more. Yeah, and I want to explore that because, you know, I think what we think of or what I think of when I think of FOMO is I'm scrolling through Instagram, yeah. right? And like that, like, oh, it must be nice to be in Havana right now or all these sorts <laughs> of things, right? Um, but talk about its applications to, you know, business decisions, you know, to being an investor. How does that manifest itself? So if you think about it, I, I, I spent a lot of time talking to uh, – neurobiologists as, as I wrote the book and I talked to business people and I talked to uh, a really fascinating woman who's an HBS uh, in class of 05, Yael Melamed, who's now a, a, she's a, a psychotherapist and she deals with relationships. I talked to all these amazing people and interviewed them to try to build a base of knowledge and then I thought about my own career uh, and, I, and I started to build these, these uh, sort of ways of thinking about FOMO and FOBO and if you think about it, Let's break them down. So FOMO, fear of missing out, is really based on uh, two factors. It's about the perception that you're missing out on something that's better than what you're doing right now. And it's about inclusion. It's the desire to be involved in a group that's doing something. And so as you think about that, what does that really melt, melt down to? It's about an asymmetry of information. It's about the fact that you are sitting here, whether it's an investment opportunity or whether it is your Instagram, this asymmetry of information allows you to fill in the dots about what what is out there that you're missing out on. And so, and so, as you think about that, that can apply to anything. That can be you sitting in the boardroom and saying, "Geez, you know, we are Pepsi, and we want to come out with something to compete with Sprite. So why don't we come up with something called Crystal Pepsi?" <laughs> and and that happened, right? And so it's it's these it's these decisions to launch products that that you think will achieve something, but you really don't know why you're doing it. It's not authentic to you. But it also gets into investment decisions. And it's things like, I, I think Bitcoin is, is a perfect example. It's also, you know, 1929. It's the, the tech boom in the year 2000. Think about that tech boom. Everybody was investing based on the fact that other people were doing it. And Warren Buffett, who who famously restrained from that, was was mocked by the media. And in fact, he stuck to his knitting and, and, and ended up doing quite well in the end. But it, it, I think that uh, that that's where FOMO really hits hits the business community. And so you see this over and over and over again with economic bubbles going back to you know the, the dawn of time. And 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 so the book really looks at how that happens and then tries to give you the tools to uh, to get away from that and to be able to make much smarter decisions. But these are two different forces. When we talk about FOMO and we talk about FOBO, and you have a nice uh, analogy here where you say FOMO is kind of like a glass of wine, but FOBO is kind of like smoking a cigarette because yes. it doesn't do anything good for him. Talk, make that analogy uh, make sense for everyone. Yeah, so, I, so FOMO is not uniformly bad because it may be that your FOMO informs you about what your desires are, things that you actually want to do. If you see somebody who you go on your Facebook and you see somebody that's in Italy, and it looks like they're having an amazing time, maybe you should take your next vacation there. If you see your friend that started their startup and you're working in investment banking, maybe you should get involved as an investor or maybe you should try to start something, right? So it can unlock the things that maybe you should try doing in a sensible way and inform you about sort of your subconscious and what it wants to do. So there's a positive there, you know, all things in moderation, but there's a positive there. FOBO, and so like a glass of wine. First glass of wine loosens you up. Maybe you want to try, you know, Second glass of wine, get a little friendlier. It's when you get to the 15th glass of wine and you're on the table <laughs> that, you, that you're in trouble. So, so FOMO in moderation can be good. FOBO, like a cigarette, there's nothing good about a cigarette. Okay, there, it, it, I mean, it may feel good at the moment, um, but it's bad for you. And also it's bad for the people around you. And so FOBO, this idea that we can't decide, that we, you know, FOBO come, is really about the combination of a desire um, to to hold out for the best, and it's also um, this this belief that option value has is really sort of 
valuable in and of itself. That combination not only hurts you because you become indecisive, you become trapped in this, in this analysis paralysis, hurts the people around you. Because all of us know that person who will never decide on anything and strings us all along, and we, those people are toxic. And so that, you know, that's the secondhand effect of the phobia, just like smoking. So we've, you know, we've identified what these forces look like. As a business leader, we can see what they look like. How, as a business leader, do we manage those forces? So there's a couple different things that you can do, and I'll give you a few examples today. The first thing you need to do is, it's amazing. So we make, there's no stats out there, by the way. I've read this stat that people make 30,000 decisions a day. That's one of those things that was put on BuzzFeed and then copied over to another. I try to find the number. If anybody knows, please let me know. But, uh, but we make many decisions every day. And most of them don't actually hold us up too much. But it is incredible to me how many times a day I spend valuable waking hours trying to decide if I'm going to have the turkey or the chicken, if I'm going to have Earl Grey or green tea. And so the first thing that I recommend to people, because at the end of the day, um, being decisive, which is the antidote to both of these things, is about finding the power to choose what you actually want and finding the courage to miss out on the rest. And so the first thing you need to do is separate the big things from the small. I call them high stakes, low stakes, and no stakes decisions. No stakes decisions are not worth any of your time. So what I do actually you know, when it's literally, you know, choosing the sandwich flavor, it's sort of like I, I say, okay, the left side of my watch is the chicken, the right is the fish. Look at it, decided, done. Moved on with my day. I spent no time on it. And I basically just outsourced that to the universe. I outsource a lot of decisions to other people. Where are we going for lunch? You decide. And so I just get those things, clear my desk, and that gives me the mental energy, time, to focus on the things that actually matter. And so when it comes to FOMO, Really what I try to do is attack that information asymmetry. I do the research on the opportunity. Is this realistic? Can I afford this? Do I have time for this? And then I start to think about my motivation. Is this something I want to do or is this being driven by this desire for inclusion? And once I do that, it allows me to then get closer to a decision. And usually, you know, I am able then to make a decision and other people are too. If I'm still stuck, I'll go for it. Because if I've done all the work and I'm still on the fence, why not? Let's go for it. And on the FOBO, uh, I think like an investor. And again, it's, it comes down to this process of doing your due diligence and looking carefully at, you know, what are the options that I have? And then being, this is the critical part. And this is the part that's quite interesting. Maximization in and of itself is not a bad thing. The problem is your process. If you keep reverting and returning to the same options without discarding them, that's where you get stuck in a negative sort of loop. And so the critical thing is, anybody here know who Marie Kondo is? So she's Marie Kondo. We love her. She's this expert on cleaning your house. And she says, when you get rid of something, thank it before you get rid of it, right? You need to do that with the options that you're not choosing. You need to mourn them and you need to move away from them. And if you can do that, say, I'm glad I was able to you know, sort of do this, but I'm now going to move on with my life. That process of actually clearing those things out of your, out of your um, decision-making uh, sort of process in and of itself, that's the magic. And so that's what I sort of talk about in the book, and that's what I've been sort of also doing in my own life. Yeah. And let's talk about the podcast, too. Patrick has a podcast called FOMO Sapiens, which is on the H- HBR network. And I wonder, I mean, you've had the opportunity to interview you know, dozens of really thoughtful business leaders. I wonder how those conversations have sort of furthered your thinking um, about you know, FOMO and FOBO. So first of all, I, I, who here knows a woman from the class of 2005 called Irina Babushkina? Anybody know Irina? So Irina, uh, it, it, giving back to HBS is something we should do because of the values that this school um spreads into the world of leadership and of giving back. However, I'll also tell you, giving back has these unintended consequences. And one of the things that happened was I was at a fundraiser, uh, a sort of a thank you event for fundraisers in New York about, um, I guess, eight months ago or something. And Irina knows Nit Noria. He was her professor. And um, she said, Nit, did you, you need to meet Patrick because he invented FOMO. And Nitin talks about FOMO every year, uh, the first day of school. And so, and I always get like tons of texts and tweets about that because people, anytime somebody sees FOMO, they tweet me. My mom called me once a day. <laughs> Guess what? Our neighbor saw FOMO on television. <laughs> and so, uh, Nitin said, well, that's quite interesting. And, and then Irina said, Patrick has this podcast he's been doing. And I was doing this just kind of for kicks. It was very, uh, it was very sort of, um, homemade, let's say. And, and, and 
and it was very early stage. But Nitin took a listen to the podcast, and he said, you, you should meet Adi Ignatius, who's the editor-in-chief of Harvard Business Review. I met Adi, and Adi said, we're actually launching this podcast network. Would you want to do a show? And so I thought, you know, this is a, this is magical. I can bring it, sort of FOMO back to HBS where it belongs. <laughs> and so we launched the show in April, and I've been really lucky because when you have Harvard, Harvard Business School, Harvard Business Review as your partner, people turn up. And so my first guest was Andrew Yang, who's running for president. And I've gone on to have actually a number of classmates, Jen Wong, who was a CEO of Reddit. I had Galen Bernard and Christina Carbonell, the founders of Primary, who were around my time in HBS. Uh, and I've had a bunch of other people uh, of that ilk. I, I really I focus on a diverse set of decision makers in politics, business, and life. And I try to get to the roots of what their decisions are. And how they got where they are, how they decide, because these are people who, are, who live in choice-rich environments, but they're doing things that are unconventional. And what I've learned, I mean, I think, listen, everybody has their own sort of path that they, that they go for. But what I've seen is, is the ones who do it really well combine data with intuition. And, what, and the reason that is is that it is data that allows us to remove all of the emotion and then we can tap into our, our intuition because at the end of the day, you'll never have perfect data, right? You, you just can't. And so even in the age of big data, I would argue we have way too much data. But the people who do this well are comfortable saying, I'm going to use all the data to reduce my opportunity set. And then from there, I'm going to accept that at times it's also going to just have to come from you know, what I believe and what I feel. And I think that combination is very powerful. You know, at the base of so much of what you do, so much of what you've written, is a deep reflection on how you live, you know? And I think it's a deep reflection that we often don't take the time to do. But I wonder what it's taught you about yourself. When I came to HBS, I come, as I said, from this small town in Maine. I worked in private equity, and I really wanted to... My identity was wrapped up in doing private equity. That was who I was. I was this private equity guy. And all, and in fact, our ski house, which is an extraordinary place full of amazing people, I think like 24 of 25 of us worked in private equity or something. And then I went to do private equity and it just blew up. And it was, and my, all of my sort of self esteem was caught up in that. And I remember coming back to my 2008 reunion. AIG had just blown up. And I was just, I thought I might as well just come in the room and say that I murdered somebody because I just feel like I've just, you know, sort of failed and I'm a terrible person. And, and it was very hard on me, uh, as it was on many of my classmates. And what it did for me, uh, was, was in the end a good thing. After AIG blew up, I remember uh, I got very, I got very sick actually. All of that stress, I, I had this weird stress related illness where I had blurry vision for six months. Uh, I couldn't get out of bed for a week. I was all messed up. And, um, and they didn't know what was wrong with me. My doctor was just like, we don't know. There's nothing. You know, you don't have mono, which they thought it was. And then a, 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 a section mate of mine named Shashank Singh got married in India. And, and I went to that wedding, and I stayed at the Taj. And the Taj had just been bombed. And I went, and I thought, you know, Raj, the Tata family, what they've done for India is incredible. I want to support them. I stayed at the hotel. It still smelled like burning. And I got in, it was three in the morning, and I walked outside of the hotel, and I was walking around the neighborhood, because I'm kind of a curious guy, and I noticed everybody sleeping, all these kids sleeping on the street. And I thought to myself, like, you know, you don't have it that bad, you know? And you, you can do other things. And frankly, maybe you should try something new. And so I got back to New York, and I tried to quit my job. And I ended up, it, it took a while to extract myself, but I just decided that I was going to bet on myself. And so I think for me, um, this whole thing has taught me that, um, and I, I know people say this all the time and it sounds so ridiculous, but, uh, but when you do, when you, when you find that thing you're supposed to do, and by the way, I never thought I would find anything. I had friends who had startups, they started companies and I was so jealous of them because I was like, they found that thing and they're really good at it. It's so natural. It's so seamless. I'll never have that. When I found it, I realized like it really does change the game. But I did it in a very risk mitigated way. I still have a day job. This is all a side thing that I do. You know, it's part of what I do. It's part of my portfolio. Um, you know, would I do it full time? I don't know. I like the other things I do as well. But being able to tap into that part of you that is like the the thing that you can do better than everybody. It's you're the one who's meant to do it. That to me, it's so um, it is so powerful. FOMO. 
And now it's time for the FOMO moment of the show. And given that today's show is all about the home of FOMO, I found somebody who can tell us if that nickname still applies. His name is Fraser Simpson, and he's a first-year student at HBS. Hey, Fraser. Hey, Patrick. Honored to be here. Great to have you. All right, let's jump right in. Is HBS still the home of FOMO? Absolutely. You know, you saw the trend and coined the term. Now, HBS, uh, it's funny, people say knowing is half the battle, and everyone is very aware of FOMO. They talk about it all the time, yet despite all of that, it is still a huge part of the HBS culture. Okay, so tell me how that plays out in your life. Uh, I think it just in the way that campus can get all caught up on things, you know, is this one information session uh, for this one random company going to make or break your HBS experience? Yes, you, it will. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, then I, I'm screwed. Uh, if you, you know, going to Mexico City, you know, if I don't book this flight right now, will I miss out an opportunity to change my life? Yes, it will. You're, well, I'm over too, uh, <laughs> but it's it's not always necessarily a bad thing either, right? The whole point of HBS is bringing together so many interesting, cool, different people that have done awesome things from all over the world. Uh, you don't want to miss out on experiences with all these people, uh, but at the same time, you don't have 80 hours in the day, and so you know the ongoing struggle for me, at least, and I think for many others, is is trying to, to parse through that and and doing it with no regrets. Fumble well, like kind of like wine, glass or two of wine. Maybe opens you up to something new. Too much wine, not a good situation. You're going to feel bad in the next day. So you just want to have, you know, a moderation of FOMO and kind of keep it in check. Now, you knew about this term. Obviously, I warned you before you went to school yes, about this, but yet you feel it. So have you been surprised by what you felt and the fact that it was sort of unavoidable? I, I think what was most surprising was for how much it's talked about, how much people still just, you know, will absolutely give in to some of its more base instincts, right? And uh, it's it's become an accepted part of the culture to talk about, but it still drives a lot of decision-making. And I think to your point on, on the wine example, right, it's uh, you want to try all t- different types of wine, but if you try them all, you won't be able to taste the difference between them, right? And so the it, it is about putting yourself out there, but, you know, you want to go all in on the things you do. I like the building on my wine analogy. Well done. So you as a bona fide FOMO sapiens. FOMO sapiens. Whatever you want to call it, uh, have been dealing with this. What are your secrets to managing your life? The biggest one uh, for me is just every Sunday trying to you know spend 30 to 40 minutes kind of planning out your week. Uh, you can't over plan, but it's look between these 800 events that are going on. What are the three or four things I want to make sure that are on my calendar for, for the week? And then that also gives you the flexibility to leave yourself open for the serendipitous moments, conversations, experiences uh, in your free time. But I find if I don't do that, uh, then the rest of the week is just a rat race and you end up running after yourself. But so those moments of reflection and kind of planning a little bit in advance uh, really make a difference for me. And how many hours of sleep are you getting a night? Uh, That is a moving target. Uh, Maybe five. Okay. You're doing really well. (laughs) Okay. Fraser, uh, so you're having an amazing time up there. I imagine you're documenting your student life on social media. So if people want to see what it's like to be a student at HBS these days, where can they find you? Well, it's nothing special, but they can follow me on Instagram at uh, Freybebe. (laughs) Where does that name come from? Well, Frey's my nickname, and that was taken. So Freybebe seemed like the next best alternative. Uh, Why didn't you just uh, use Fraser Simpson? Touche. (laughs) <laughs> okay, Fraser Simpson, Bray Bay Bay. Uh, we'll check you out and um, good luck at school. Thanks, Patrick. FOMO. Big news. You can now pre order my upcoming book, Fear of Missing Out Practical Decision Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice, at patrickmcginnis.com slash FOMO Sapiens. While you're there, make sure to download my free gift for you, the FOMO Sapiens Handbook, which is an exclusive guide to spotting and managing FOMO and even turning it into a force for good. Just remember, you can find links to all things FOMO Sapiens in the show notes. And if you really don't want to miss out, subscribe to my official newsletter, What Did I Miss? by texting FOMO to 66866 or signing up at patrickmcginnis.com. FOMO Sapiens is part of the HBR Presents Network. The show is produced by AW360 and recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis. If you like today's show, please be sure to subscribe, rate it, and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at patrickmcginnis.com. You can also take the official FOMO diagnostic at patrickmcginnis.com slash FOMO dash quiz to find out if you're a FOMO sapiens. FOMO.